I find a lot of enthusiasm among the, you know, young and uh, uh, not so young audiences. So probably uh, we will take more questions. They are, we are here to listen to the panelists and you, the, the audience. So probably I will uh, forgo whatever I have to say at the beginning. So distinguished uh, uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Dhanraj. <clears throat> um, uh, the, the subject is uh, conver convergences and challenges for India and Japan in the Indo-Pacific security and defense cooperation. A very good subject. Probably more uh, similar to some of the things already discussed, but there are subtle differences which even I was not aware till we had a little chat the other day while we were discussing who will go first and uh, what subjects each one of us will be discussing. So, Professor, we'll, we'll start with our honored guest from Japan. Uh, that is Professor Isuyama, Mari Isuyama. Uh, she will start with a survey of the evolution of India-Japan's strategic partnership, and she will point to uh, some common uh, strategic orientations. Uh, she will follow it or probably introduce uh, the uh, Japan's new security documents focusing on how India matters to Japan in new strategy. This is a very interesting subject as far as I am concerned. I was probably under the wrong impression that uh, Japan started taking interest in, in India uh, when they needed a place to a country, a reliable country to invest because they were not uh, um, noticing much um, growth in their uh, GDP. So they needed a place to invest where they can cooperate and uh, benefit mutually. So their uh, new strategies will be very, very important to all of us. Um, and she will also compare the India defense cooperation with the India, uh, Japan Australia cooperation, another interesting subject, madam, uh, because, um, you know, when uh, uh, the former uh, Japanese Prime Minister, the late uh, Shinzo Abe, came up with the idea of uh, um, uh, Quad in 2007, way back, maybe five or six years, before the Chinese started uh, their uh, assertiveness or showing their assertiveness in the South China Sea. He was such a visionary, so we all remember uh, uh, Shinzo Abe with a lot of uh, respect in India. Uh, so at that time, we all know that uh, Australia had backed out Kevin Rudd developed coal feed and uh, the, the idea was uh, uh, coal storage for another 10 years. And it was again uh, when uh, Shinzo Abe became the prime minister, he, he revived the idea. So we, suppose we have a quad, which, is a, which will prove to be an integral part of our relationship. Uh, of course, it's one of the integral parts, I would say. And uh, if Australia or USA, you know, USA gets some concession. I'm not anti-American. We need American presence in the Indo-Pacific. I strongly believe in it. Uh, so does Japan. Uh, but if suppose Australia or even USA back out of this or slows down a little bit on this relationship, so wh what will happen to our uh, relationship, India-Japan relationship? So that's very important thing we would like to know. Uh, then, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Admiral Murli Dharan, he is a well-known speaker in Kerala on strategic affairs. So he will speak on the Indo-Japan marit maritime defense cooperation in the context of the current importance of the Indo-Pacific. Very current, very topical subject. And uh, he will also uh, briefly uh, give us an overview of the Indo-Pacific from the merit, maritime perspective. The next uh, speaker is uh, Prakash, uh, Professor Prakash Panir Selvam. Uh, he will also speak on similar lines, but on the geopolitical dimensions of uh, India-Japan maritime cooperation, uh, security cooperation. 
And interestingly, we'll uh, uh, discuss the challenges before India and Japan as the geopolitical situation in the Indo-Pacific is changing, very fast changing. And uh, luckily for us, he will also incorporate or factor in the Ukraine crisis and uh, Taiwan crisis uh, into his uh, discussions. So without losing much time or any more time, I would request uh, Professor Isuvi Yama to press, make her press remarks. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman, for kind introduction. I'm Marie Izuyama from National Institute for Defense Studies, Japan. I express my gr great gratitude to CPPR and Consulate General of Japan in Chennai to organize such an important event today and yesterday. And I am very honored to be here as a part of the conference. The purpose of my paper is to point out how India matters in Japan's new security documents released in last December. My understanding is India matters in two ways. First, in alliance and deterrence context for Japan, and secondly, in more broader order-making context. That is number three and number four. Uh, but this broader uh, context, uh, yesterday, uh, in the first session, it was dealt um, uh, in detail. So I omit this part first. I will sketch evolution of India-Japan strategic partnership and then briefly talk about Japan's new security document and India's place in it. Uh, however, um, I uh, avoid to go into the detail of uh, um, chronological detail. Uh, I just want to point out the commonality of India and Japan's strategic orientation. Yesterday, Professor Nalapad stated about India and Japan's defensive deployment. I'd like to reiterate it in my paper, um, although in a more narrower sense. Uh, India and Japan had common strategic orientation, that is, defensive posture, prudence in use of force, and some domestic sensitivity to out-of-the-area operation. But because of this commonality, we had faced the common challenge in 9-11 and Iraqi war in the early 2000. Amid expectation and pressure from the United States, we had to ponder on the question, to what extent should we contribute militarily in order to maintain the US-led world order? Um, so another common denomination for India and Japan is our mutual endorsement for rise as normal state. In 2008, Joint Declaration on Security Cooperation, it was stated that a strong and prosperous India is the interest of Japan and that a strong and prosperous Japan is the interest of India. Indeed, India unintentionally expanded Japan's maritime sphere and consequently normalized Japan. Uh, there are some examples um, here, uh, but I will skip it. So, I'll move to Japan's security documents. In last December, Japan released three new security documents. National Security Strategy, NSS, National Defense Strategy, NDS, and Defense Build-Up build Program. For Japan, change of power balance is identified as a global challenge. Uh, this global power shift is, i.e., um, uh, U.S. decline and China's rise. As to the Indo-Pacific, this NSS unequivocally presents China as the greatest strategic challenge. Uh, this is very different from the former NSS. For example, the NSS points China's activity in, the, in and around the Senkaku Island as intensified attempts to unilaterally challenge 
uh, unilaterally change the status quo by force in the maritime and air domains. China's strengthening strategic ties with Russia is also identified as an attempt to challenge the international order. In addition, China's exerting economic pressure utilizing non-transparent development finance as well as intensified military activities in the sea and airspace surrounding Taiwan is identified as a matter of serious concern for Japan and the international community. Facing global and regional challenge, Japan is transforming its security strategy. As to defense capability, our government committed to fundamentally reinforce Japan's defense capabilities and increase its defense budget. So just uh, um, uh, one month before, uh, the, there are 20% um, hike over our defense budget for the fiscal year uh, 2023. Guided by NSS, the new National Defense Strategy, NDS, stipulates Japan's basic objectives First, to shape a security environment that does not tolerate unilateral changes to the status quo by force. And second, to deter such attempts uh, through, throughout cooperation with our ally and like-minded countries. Both NSS and NDS reaffirm that the Japan-US alliance plays an indispensable role not only for the security of Japan, but also for peace and stability in the international community, including the Indo-Pacific. And we also determined to work with partners. The feature of NSS and the NDS is that our partners are confined to like-minded countries. But which, is the, which countries are like-minded countries? Actually, Australia is listed in NDS at top and uh, India follows. Then comes UK, France, Germany, and Italy, NATO, and EU. Other like-minded countries include uh, Republic of Korea, Canada, New Zealand, and ASEAN. From Japanese perspective, collaborating with Australia and India have dual potential for security of Japan. One is, as I say, plurilateral cooperation uh, to make the vision of FOIP more universal. And uh, especially, uh, it stated that uh, uh, Quad is uh, such an instrument. Uh, however, um, in addition to that, a building multi layered network among Australia and India is also a mean to strengthen deterrence for Japan. Uh, to evaluate Japan-Indian bilateral defense cooperation in the deterrence and alliance context, Japan's defense cooperation with India and Australia is compared here. Uh, so the upper row show how agreements uh, evolved uh, from uh, 2008 uh, joint declaration. Then comes AXA, then GSOMIA, and the uh, Transfer of Defense Equipment and Technology Agreement. And uh, finally, status of force, but this is only with Australia. And the, the bottom rows show uh, the, the actual action uh, practice. Uh, there are dialogue mechanisms like two and two, and trilateral mechanism with the United States, and joint naval exercise, but this will dealt with uh, uh, another presenter, follows me. And uh, um, the, the, the at, at most bottom one is military equipment and technology. Uh, but here, uh, both uh, with Australia and with uh, India, uh, this does not uh, have uh, much success. Uh, so, the process of institutionalization uh, is a very similar path. And uh, we can see Prime Minister Abe's pivotal role in both uh, with Australia and India. Engaging Australia and India, Japan was expanding its security scope and transforming security architecture from uh, hub and spoke to model to web model. In terms of bilateral naval exercise, actually, Japan-India uh, is much more ahead of Japan-Australia uh, from my uh, thinking. In terms of trilateral with the United States, 
Japan, Australia, US trilateral is much more developed. So the takeaway here is that Japan Indian Security Corporation is less connected to the US alliance system compared to Japan Australia Corporation. And the Ukraine war reveals that there is still a kind of alliance, non alliance, or uh, alliance uh, or, um, strategic autonomy con uh, conundrum uh, between uh, vis a vis uh, India in our bilateral relations. Although India's strategic autonomy is well apprehended in Japan, there is a tendency to wishfully look India as an ally among the public in Japan. I think so like-mindedness between Japan and India is continuously under the test. Also, uh, it is not clear whether we agree on the interpretation of status quo, because the status quo is somehow as a keyword in uh, new security documents. Uh, here I come to, uh, this is related to Dr. Amor Mukia, uh, Mukia's statement in the last session. Um, that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I wonder uh, how India um, think about status quo in the India-China border. So uh, the, my final word is uh, let us deepen our discussion on strategic objective defense capabilities and how to use forces. Then our engagement in maritime domain and air domain would work as a more harder balancing vis-a-vis -vis disrupting power. This concludes my session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Isuyama. One thing I would like to uh, bring, uh, you know, some sort of an anxiety among some of the Indians that despite all such uh, good, excellent relations we are having between India and Japan, uh, why there are hardly any Indian students studying in India? I think the number is, uh, from what I remember, is around 1,200 or, or something around that number only. Whereas even with China, where we have programs, uh, problems all the while, there are, are over 20,000 students, maybe most of them medical students, they study there. With USA, it's 200,000 or more. Canada, it's 300,000. Even Syria, I found some students there. I don't know whether these uh, statistics are correct or not. Um, so there should be some reason, maybe, uh, it, even there are more Nepal, I can understand for more uh, Vietnamese students studying in Japan, uh, but um, there are even more uh, Nepalese students studying in Japan than the Indians. So there has to be some reason, probably the Indian, I, we may not be able to blame the Japanese unless there's a policy on controlling the Indian students, we don't know. Maybe there are no, we are not keen to send our children there. Ch children are not keen to take up studies there because they may not be allowed to work for four hours per week or whatever, some arrangements, people make some money. Then they are allowed to work for two years uh, so that they can make some money and repay their study loans. We don't know. Um, probably I hope uh, uh, this is a matter which uh, you know concerns all of us. So thank you, ma'am. Excellent uh, presentation. I will be the first person to read the full uh, paper when it is published by CPPR. Now I invite uh, Admiral uh, Murli Dharan. Um, I told you earlier he is one of the greatest uh, st strategic minds in Kerala at least. I am not aware of the other places. So when he speaks about uh, the, the, the Indo-Japanese maritime defense cooperation in the context of current importance of the Indo-Pacific. I would request him to uh, say a few words about Chinese uh, overtures or activities in South um, Pacific, uh, its agreements in, uh, with the South pa Islands in that region, uh, especially when China is or has been able to, I will use 
that word, has been able to enter into an agreement with Solomon Islands where Chinese military, not military, security people, obviously it's a military, people can be deployed in the maintenance of domestic law and order, which is a very strange thing. They have agreed to it, of course, arm twisting by the Chinese. Uh, so this will lead not only to, law, you know, uh, anyway, I will not go further into that. He knows what I mean. So I'll request uh, Admiral Murli Dharan to uh, say a few words. At the outset, let me begin by thanking CPPR and the Consulate General of Japan in Chennai for hosting such a, a seminar on a very important topic and also giving me an opportunity uh, to be part of it. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Murli I, my fellow panelists. <clears throat> in fact, um, the emergence of uh, Indo-Pacific as a construct, as a thought, has realigned uh, relationships and strategic engagements between nations in the region, as well as there are a lot of extra-regional powers or nations with economic and strategic interests in the region. Now, the endeavors of uh, India and Japan in the maritime domain to ensure our vision, joint vision, is to have an inclusive, open Indo-Pacific to ensure good order at sea. Uh, this has also been an enabler for bringing India and Japan together in many other fields. Now, you'll wonder why so much uh, importance being given to the maritime domain or to Indo-Pacific as such. Now, you'll see that uh, if you look at the geostrategic significant seas, about 70% of the earth is covered by sea. Two-thirds of the population lives within 100 nautical miles. That's about 200 kilometers of coast. 150 of the 193 member states are all coastal states. 80% of cities and virtually all major trade and financial centers are within 200 kilometers of the coastline. Now, the globalization of trade that has taken place, trade and commerce, and the increasing liberalization, interlinking of economies towards the end of last century, and the fact that bulk of it takes place via the maritime routes has further raised the relevance of maritime domain. Now, there's also much closer cooperations between nations in manufacturing, no, it's, I'll come in it, resulting in an enhanced uh, economic interdependence and development of newer technologies in communication and transportation have further enhanced trade and this will only increase further. Additionally, uh, the, as the resources dwindle on land, we are going to look at more and more at the oceans, uh, which is virtually untapped right now uh, because the technology is still, it's still cost intensive. It may not be very cost intensive for us to recover, but we have started. India, for example, has analyzed about 75,000 square kilometers of land in the South Indian Ocean, which has now been given to India for further exploitation. Now, in the last uh, century, in the 19th century, actually, Admiral Mahan, who was actually a naval thinker and historian, he had talked about Indian Ocean becoming key to the seven seas. Uh, and in the 21st century, how uh, this towards uh, how the entire world will be controlled by the Indian Ocean. But by the end of 20th century, it is very clear that we can't look at Indone Indian Ocean is in isolation. A multipolar world came up soon after the Cold War and what I mentioned earlier, globalization of trade, etc. All this, now there are Asian economies which are developing uh, looking for energy resources from the Arabian Gulf and from Africa for minerals and other resources, actually increased the shipping uh, uh, between the thing. And we could actually look at the oceans. You can look at it as can be seen on the slide, how it can look as viewed as one entity. And it was actually Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, when he spoke to the Indian parliament, he spoke of the Pacific and Indian Oceans are bringing about a dynamic coupling as seas of freedom and prosperity. Actually, he went on to say that our two countries have the ability, and note the word responsibility, 
to ensure that it broadens further and these seas become seas of clearest transparency. But the concept probably got the first official recognition in the Pacific when the uh, Australians came out of the Defence White Paper in 2013, where indicated Indo-Pacific as one theatre. Now, there are also many who claim that uh, with China's expansion, its string of pearl strategy, etc., uh, got the entire, not only the countries of the region, but the other powers, other nations who got interest in this area, got worried, and they started looking at Indo-Pacific as one uh, geo-economic and security zone. Now, as you will see, Indo-Pacific is a multicultural, multipolar region accounting for 60% of the world's GDP and 65% of its population. It's a major repository of marine resources. And as per the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Antard estimates that 80% of the global trade by volume and 70% of value is transported across the sea. Now those little, little dots that you see, the red dots, are actually the ships uh, which are transiting the oceans across the world at any time. And about 60% of this actually passes through the Indo-Pacific, with South China Sea carrying an estimated one-third of the global shipping. Now the, as you can see, South China is important for China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and all of whom rely on the Straits of Malacca, which connects that into the Bay of Bengal and by extension, linking Pacific and Indian Ocean. Now, China's uh, economy is actually 64% of its trade uh, takes place through this area. As far as Japan is concerned, it's about 42% of our trade that passes through South China Sea. Now, if you see India, 90% of our trade by volume and a 70% by value, which is about, uh, worth about um, $750 billion, of which about 55%, uh, about $5 trillion passes through South China Sea. And its share with our trade with the ASEAN nations is uh, alone is about 11 to 12% of our total maritime trade. Now you can see that uh, due to the very nature of maritime domain, you can't look at this in pockets as Arabian Sea or Bay of Bengal or Indian Ocean, South China Sea, etc. The whole thing has to be looked at one examination. Now, one thing that came up, uh, what everybody looking at is when you talk of Indo-Pacific is look how China has reached out into its, uh, its economic belt, whether you call it the maritime road or the economic belt, how it's virtually fanned out in the entire uh, Indian Ocean region uh, further into expanding more and more into the Pacific. It's got a base in Djibouti. It's trying to build up friendships. Now, our, close to our own in Sri Lanka, so much investment they have made, they virtually made many of these countries as captive because they can't repay the kind of money that has been taken. So this is one thing. And um, what China is very famous is for what they do, a policy in South China Sea especially, is called salami slicing. Small changes they keep making, which by itself you don't, uh, you're not worried. But suddenly you find that so many changes have been brought about that they have changed the entire complexion of the area. As Professor Naya was mentioning, now they're expanding into the island territories of the Pacific Ocean. Now, that's a topic by itself. But I can only say in brief that when you have an island there, there are two, three things which is an island. Virtually by the rules, about 200 nautical miles around it is an exclusive economic zone of that island for it to exploit. And you can imagine how much can be exploited. Similarly, uh, if you can base ships there, you can operate your aircraft through it, your reach expands tremendously. Now, with the China, the PLA Navy expanding so much, they're actually virtually looking for bases all across or operating this thing. Now, some of the major countries, you know, would put restrictions, would control it. But if you go to an island territory which is not looking for finances, you fund it, you will find that they're able to get everything going. Now, having taken an overview of all this, uh, we'll find that uh, maritime security has a very predominant role, whatever you look at. And the challenges to maritime security are, you know, this can be seen, economic well-being, the social stability, which political peace, 
maritime sovereignty. Now you can see South China Sea, how China has been building artificial islands, claiming more and more territory. And the UNCLOS, which said that it is what China has done is wrong, they just totally said, we don't believe in UNCLOS, and what they have said, it does not matter to us, uh, because it's a bilateral between the two nations. Now, with this kind of, uh, uh, for want of a better term, and use a Hindi word, Dadagiri, or trying to share, use the force, is what they're trying to do. Now, the non-conventional threats, because the conventional fights between nations have actually reduced after the World War, so now you find terrorism, drug trafficking, arms trafficking, piracy, human trafficking, illegal migration, and um, IUU fishing, that is illegal, unauthorized fishing that you do, you're actually tapping into the reserves of nations. It's big economy. And you have economic and environmental threats which could actually affect your nation as such. Now, many of these are also emerging from non-state actors who could actually be funded by various states who want to remain in the background. So you won't even come to know who's funding it. Uh, in piracy, you the classic case. The actual pirates who embarked used to get a pittance. They were like daily wage laborers. The money used to be exchanged in London and other places. All that was happening. Now, it would be very apparent that um, with the size of the maritime common, common interest that we have and the seamless nature of maritime domain, no single nations can operate. And uh, actually, naval dimensions are universally accepted to be a way of looking after this, while you have high-level political contacts which can be discussed, but actually on the ground to protect, you need the naval forces, maritime forces, whether the navies or the coast guard, and when they jointly exercise, it not only symbolizes to the external that, look, these nations are operating together, and they can come together whenever it's required. It's a confidence building, and both the forces also get to know each other better. Now, over the last two decades, India and Japan have intensified cooperation at bilateral levels, at various levels. Virtually, revival of, as been mentioned by many previous speakers, centuries of uh, linkages between the two nations that we had. Strategically, both are maritime nations interested in keeping the sea lanes open. And uh, both actually got together uh, which started in a way with the Alandra Rainbow Incident, which uh, what happened was, now if you can see the name Megarama, the pirates had actually re rewritten the name. Uh, it was a joint operation between the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard, which rescued the ship and restored it to their rightful owners. So this is where we got a major fillip to our activity. And uh, then came together the tsunami of 2004, where we had an informal grouping of India, Japan, US, and Australia came together to help uh, render humanitarian assistance to the nations affected in the region. Then it went on when the piracy attacks started of Somalia, all nations got together. Now India and Japan are again, which are together in this. Now, military exercises take place between the three forces, Army, Navy, and Air Force, sometimes all three of them together, both nations, sometimes singly. Coast Guards are also very much part of it. <laughs> and often, joint exercises enable uh, nations to take part and join together. Now, this is actually the uh, uh, exercise between Coast Guard of uh, Japan and India. And uh, I've been fortunate that in two of such major exercises, I was able to take part in it. And uh, since then, uh, we had the, uh, uh, this is between the navies that take place with GEMEX, which everybody spoke about. It started in 2012. <coughs> uh, we had the sixth edition uh, last time. And also, we take part in many bilateral exercises like Milan, uh, which has got virtually all the nations in this area taking part. Then you also had the Malabar uh, series of exercises. Now, whenever you talk of all this, it's been mentioned earlier, Quad, it's a maritime cooperation. You can see the nations are virtually at four corners of Indo-Pacific. 
Uh, now, the only thing is that America, when they, their definition of Indo-Pacific comes only up to the east coast of India. Whereas Indian definition is we are going right across the Arabian Sea into the east coast of uh, Africa, uh, which is, uh, you know, when you see that, we actually cover all this area that we want to cover. Now, with all this, uh, what has also happened is many of them said that, uh, like uh, this actually is mentioned earlier, it came together after the tsunami, but uh, group actually met again uh, after the 2007, the ARF on the sidelines. It was again an uh, initiative put, uh, put forward by the then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan. But some said it's a coalition against China, there were hesitancies. And finally, it was revived again in 2017. We call it Quad 2.0 now. And the collective vision is to keep the sea lanes open. Now, our defense exchanges gained strength over the years due to convergence of strategic matters. Most importantly, outlook towards security of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, strategic cooperation, India and Japan, which began with the strategic and global partnership of 2006, which developed into a special strategic and global partnership of 2014, and a joint declaration of security cooperation between India and Japan, signed in 2008. Then we had the MOU exchanges of 2014, and then transfer of defense technology, all has been talked of a little earlier. And uh, when uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and uh, Shinzo Abe and the current Prime Minister, they all uh, there were almost 32 MOUs signed on agreementing deeper cooperation between the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and the Indian Navy, greater exchange of information, the AXA, which is talked about by the previous speaker. Uh, again, logistic sharing arrangements will be similar to what we have with uh, US, Australia, Singapore, France. It will further contribute. And then to develop further, we have had the 2 plus 2 Defense and External Affairs Ministers meeting, the second of which uh, we had recently. And then the Maritime uh, Affairs Dialogue takes place between both nations, and we had the sixth round uh, in 21. And the navies and coast guards exercise regularly, and uh, you can see virtually school children welcoming the coast guard, Japanese coast guard ship coming in. And we also had to, because you will understand that to understand the maritime domain, it's what we know as maritime domain awareness, which comes with a whole lot of inputs that come in through the satellites, on the ground, through the, at the sea. All that is put together. We have an information fusion center, which India started in Gurugram, near Delhi, in 2018. Entire all countries, and Japan has got a permanent uh, liaison officer placed at the information fusion center. Then uh, another converging area that took place was when uh, India's vision of Sagar was expressed by our Prime Minister, which was expanded into the, at the East Asia Summit into an Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiatives. You can see that uh, it's got the complete thing of maritime security, maritime ecology, resources, capacity building, disaster and risk reduction management, science, technology, and academic cooperation, now, this is something when the professor spoke a little earlier about less students going there. Trade connectivity and maritime transport. Now, in all this, Japan actually readily came forward to cooperate in this aspect. So this is something that uh, we can, you can see the entire maritime aspect is covered in this. Many more nations have come forward to join. And it's something that we can, if you take it forward, the entire Indo-Pacific uh, oceans will be fine. <coughs> Let me sum up by saying that the concept of Indo-Pacific and its emergence as a theater of economic strategy competition in the 21st century has given India and Japan an opportunity to expand our strategic cooperation. As uh, our external affairs minister, Sir Jay Shankar, says in his book, The India Way, and I quote, a shared interest in securing global commons has brought about a convergence between very different polities. This realization in two nations that they have little choice but to help shape their continent, continent is now an impelling force of a new relationship." Unquote. And maritime cooperation 
is a key area of the special strategic and global partnership between both our nations. The maritime nations, navies and coast guards have always played a significant role uh, in keeping sea lanes open and also expanding relationship. And one of the things that China's expanding footprints into the area, which we discussed, is something that the entire world is worried about. So if you have actually presence of maritime forces, like what do you do? Like if China has got into Djibouti and everywhere else, if there are Indian and Japanese ships operating in South China Sea, you know, that area there, we are operating that area, it will get them also worried into what it is. You are not being, you are not going into his territory. It's the old gunboat diplomacy of the 19th century being revived in a different fashion. You are there on the horizon. If a threat emerges, you can appear and you can disappear over the horizon. You are not got into anybody's territorial waters, but you are operating that area. The very fact that you are maritime force are operating in this area and jointly will make somebody think twice. So our own vision of uh, India's vision of Sagar and the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, Japan can be a very crucial partner and together we can take it forward. We need regular interaction, uh, not only at the political and the other level, but more importantly, at the maritime uh, uh, force level, that can only tackle all the maritime threats and challenges. Uh, thank you. While I conclude, you know, just as a thought that came to me about the cooperation, we all talk of recent cooperation. Uh, my Japanese friends here will know, there's a Japan International Center in Tokyo. Many of you here are familiar with the India International Center in New Delhi. Now, the idea of India International Center came to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru on his visit to uh, Japan, and he came and told here, let us set up something similar here. And that is how we set up the India International Center. Uh, I've been fortunate to have stayed at the Japanese International Center where I learned this history. And India International Center, of course, most of us have interacted in their seminars. Thank you. Jai. Admiral Murli Dharan for an excellent, crisp uh, presentation. I'm, I'm sure the students uh, sitting at the back would probably would not have uh, asked for a better presentation on the subject. In, a, in, a, in such a limited uh, period of time. Now, uh, I request uh, Professor uh, Prakash Paneer Selvam. Uh, I, have, I was fortunate to listen to him on a couple of webinars. Probably you are not aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he will speak on the geopolitical aspects or the dimensions of the Indo-Pacific Maritime Security Cooperation. And what are the challenges before India and Japan? as the geopolitical situation in the Indo-Pacific is changing. So as I said at the beginning, it will also factor in the Ukraine crisis, the Taiwan crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So um, he has also promised in the little chat we had the other day that in case something has been left out in the discussions so far, he will uh, try to include that in his presentation. So I think uh, we have... Uh, enough time for you to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for the um, introduction. And uh, I again like to thank uh, CPPR and uh, Japanese Consulate in Chennai for giving me this opportunity uh, and share my views on India-Japan relations. And actually, I took some liberty in changing the topic. Uh, uh, so like I thought like uh, um, already uh, Admiral Sir has spoken about Maritime, def uh, uh, maritime security. So I thought I will. Uh, I've been listening. I've uh, been like working on maritime governance issues. So I thought incorporate those ideas into my presentation. So I think that would be the way forward. So and uh, thank you again for uh, this is a wonderful panel. And I think in this two-day session uh, we at least I think there are four speakers who uh, sp spoke about maritime. Uh, security or they touched upon uh, various dimensions of maritime security. Uh, that's a very interesting fact because in 2007, when I went to JNE for my MPhil and my proposal was uh, India-Japan Maritime Security Corporation, uh, my center people in the interview, everybody laughed saying that it's not highly possible because it's only political economy, India-Japan. 
so I fortunate to have Srikant Kondapoli that time. So he somehow uh, liked my presentation, so that's how I got into it. Now, after like so many years, and after uh, looking at many people speaking on the subject, it's quite interesting. And uh, in 2008, actually, I met uh, Iziyama San. Again, it's, uh, I don't know how many people are, you know, like Iziyama San is a few uh, Japanese scholar work on India for a very long time. So when I went in 2008, I met Iziyama San. So since then, we have been in touch and we've been working on India Japan. Uh, cooperation. So uh, coming back to the before presentation about the Indian students in Japan, uh, Japanese uh, government offer Momuga Gakusho, a fellowship uh, for master students and but it's advanced research masters and PhD program. And every year you have like at least uh, 15 to 20 students from India uh, go for higher studies to Japan. But unlike Western countries, um, to pursue education from the bachelors. Uh, in undergrads in uh, Japan, uh, you have to have some Japanese language training, otherwise it will be very difficult. Um, but since it's an advanced courses, uh, Japanese is not mandatory. Again, in Mombaga Gakusho, uh, one year Japanese training will be given at the free of cost Japan is giving. Uh, but I, there are a lot of private universities are coming in Japan right now. I think they are taking in a lot of Indian students. Uh, so. Uh, that's uh, my like the question you asked. Sir. So uh, diving into my presentation, sir, uh, I think like um, uh, Admiral sir has actually briefly touched upon the uh, the area which uh, I, I was trying to do it in my first slide here. Uh, so uh, there is an emerging geopolitical concern, and uh, the way we perceive geopolitics right now, it's been like it's undergoing a shift in terms of uh, the various geopolitical aspect, like Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, uh, which actually raised a kind of pertinent question, what would happen in South China Sea? Uh, and uh, India is, and Japan is also very much concerned about the China-US strategic competition. So the competition between them, it's a major concern for both the countries, primarily because they should not uh, drawn into that conflict and making uh, like similar kind of Russia-Ukraine conflict here in this region. And uh, there is also a biggest fear in both India and Japan uh, about China unilaterally trying to change the status quo in the East, East Asia and Southeast Asia. Like, for example, Senkaku Island and South China Sea and East China Sea is a major flashpoint in the region. So this is, again, a major concern from Japan. And uh, Japan is like very much interested in J India's uh, view how uh, to solve this particular issue on this. So this is another major uh, problem uh, in terms of emerging geopolitics. So again, from India concern, uh, India, China's growing influence in the Indian Ocean is a major problem for India and other um, seafaring countries. Uh, recently, uh, China has invited a lot of um, uh, Indian Ocean countries uh, to have a kind of dialogue last December. And China has been pretty much active in uh, uh, maritime uh, Silk Road and have invested in so many small island countries in the region, uh, which has been a kind of traditional considers uh, India's arena of influence. So this has been a major concern for India. So this is emerging geopolitics is a bit of worry for both India and Japan in, because a lot of act activities happening in uh, maritime domain, as Admiral Sarah has pointed out, how it can also have a kind of uh, naval implications. Uh, but I'm uh, on maritime arena, actually, I just d didn't want to use the maritime security uh, because now the maritime security is like, it's um, expanding into different areas of discussion now. Uh, so in security, uh, I just divided into uh, the thoughts which I have here. Like on security, uh, traditionally the gray zone operation, what uh, Admiral Sarah has pointed out, how China is trying to use uh, uh, militias in order to assert uh, their influence in the Senkaku Island or like in South China Sea. So we thought it's only uh, restricted to South China Sea. Like what we are seeing right now, uh, Chinese vessels, like fire, for example, hydrographic vessels and uh, maritime research vessels, uh, they have been like loitering in Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. So this is the kind of first step Chinese have been pursuing, like Indian Ocean. We thought it's only uh, very limited to South China Sea and Senkaku Island issue. But we also, India is also finding it, um, the gray zone operation, I, I think it started. And uh, their vessels have been constantly deployed in this region uh, for uh, due to do some marine, marine scientific research, uh, uh, to, um, um, to take samples and collect samples from, um, uh, from the Arabian Sea for the submarine operations. 
So this is a major concern for India. I think it should be a major area of uh, um, uh, focus should be given. And in non-traditional security, again, like uh, we have talked about piracy, terrorism, uh, you fishing, like Admiral Sir has pointed out, and illegal activities at sea, various other aspects. And marine safety, uh, I just want to highlight where India and Japan can cooperate, the cyber attack. So a lot of naval uh, merchant vessels are having a lot of electronic systems on board, and they are, most of them are uh, connected with internet. So uh, cyber attack has been very frequent, and this is going to be a major challenge for shipping industries. And India Japan, I think, uh, have a kind of uh, have a dialogue here on um, cyber uh, security cooperation. There is a kind of dialogue happens between India Japan on cyber security. But I think uh, it's not, it's very broad, primarily it's been restricted to 5G technology and um, uh, semiconductors. But in maritime, uh, it's not much of focus here. I think uh, the cyber security cooperation between India and Japan should also emphasize and focus on uh, the maritime arena. Uh, marine pollution is again a major problem in Indian Ocean as well as like in the, any part of the world. Uh, it's going to have a bigger impact in terms of affecting our flora and fauna, and it's going to be a major challenge for any um, um, uh, coastal countries, coastal uh, states. Uh, climate change is again a new phenomenon where we have been increasingly witne witnessing uh, violent natural disasters. Uh, many uh, scientific paper alludes to the, the natural disasters because of the uh, sea, level sea level rising and the climate change. I think this is going to have a major impact on our design and infrastructure on seaports. So I think uh, climate change is the, uh, another area. And legal framework, uh, exclusive economic zone has been contested and uh, there are a lot of uh, like um, uh, illegal fishing happening in the exclusive zone. And exploitation of resources beyond the national jurisdictions, again it's been a kind of discussion. So what should be the framework and how to exploit the resources in high seas is going to be a major challenge. So uh, both in the kind of geopolitical issues and maritime affairs, I think it's not the same what we discuss. It's been largely shifting uh, 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 from a kind of very traditional security way of looking at. So coming back to India, Japan. So what is the like like what's happening? In the, how the shift is happening in the geopolitics and the maritime affair? So in shift is also happening in India, Japan relations accordingly. So India-Japan relationship actually I divided into two aspects. One is from 1991 to uh, 2012. So 1999, the Alundra Rainbow incident, actually first time uh, India has been in touch with Japan in terms of pursuing the maritime security. So soon after the Alundra Rainbow incident, India, Indian Coast Guard and Japan Coast Guard started uh, uh, maritime exercises. Since then, uh, both Coast Guard been regularly conducting their uh, maritime exercise, and slowly Navy started to come into the uh, maritime exercise. So if we talk about the relations between the uh, 1999 to 2012, the joint statement, if you read, most of the uh, items will be on maritime security. So you will see, looking at how the maritime order is important, how the security is important of this region. Again, this is a time. Uh, the piracy in the Straits of Malacca started to reduce, and the piracy in the Somali in the Somali region, Gulf of Aden, uh, started to increase. So there's been a lot of emphasis has been given on maritime security, piracy, hijacking the ship for the ransom. These have been the discussion during the bilateral talks, and any academic discussions happens largely focused on these arenas. And uh, we should also understand 1999, post 1999, the US uh, freedom of uh, uh, operation and during freedom, JMSDF ships have been constantly deployed in the Indian Ocean region to assist the US forces. And that also gave a kind of uh, opportunity for the Indian Navy to interact with the JMSDF vessels. And uh, this is the time, again, JMSDF vessel also thought of deploying the JMSDF vessels in the Indian Ocean and also had a kind of Djibouti as the naval base, which will act as a kind of uh, overseas base in order to deal with non-traditional security threat. So what happened in 2012? 2012 is very significant in two ways. One is Japan uh, nationalized Senkaku Island. So the whole nature of the perspective of security idea of Japan has completely changed when Japan nationalized the Senkaku Island. So what is again for India? 
So rise of Xi Jinping in China and the BRI and MSR which came into 2013. So the whole notion of maritime security and the maritime domain has been completely changed. So if you see any joint statement and any dialogue and discussion which happens between India and Japan, so the more emphasis has been given on free and open order, maintaining the stability and uh, uh, establishing the rule-based order. So this has been the major uh, discussion between 2012 and 2023. And uh, in India also there is a major, domestically India also looked for uh, Prime Minister Modi become the Chief Minister, uh, sorry, Prime Minister. And his uh, policy towards uh, the Japan and the East Asia has uh, took a momentum from the act uh, uh, from the Lukis to the Actist policy. So there is a huge set of issues happening in terms of India-Japan relationship as well. Uh, then again, the ASEAN centrality has been the very much quest of both India and Japan in their uh, uh, talking about Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, only way India differs is India insists on using the inclusive order in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Japan uses a free and open order in the Indo-Pacific. So otherwise, rest looks the same. And India also have like um, um, Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, which actually puts forward uh, the it's the issue be in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. It's not only restricted uh, to the security issues, but it also has to look into the different dimensions, which has been a major problem for India and other regional countries. So if you see that the seven uh, items here, it's maritime security is one of them. So other, other area of focus has been maritime ecology, maritime resource capacity building and resource sharing, uh, disaster risk reduction and management, science and technology, academic cooperation, and trade connectivity and maritime transportation. In the two-day conference and most of the topic, which most of the sessions is also covered largely in this theme as well. So I uh, really found very interesting. So, uh, so the, the, if you see the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, 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 free and open Indo-Pacific policy of Japan, or like so, the stability and order and law of rule-based order has been emphasized. So, I think it's a two stage of looking at a shift in the India-Japan relationship. So, what happened domestically? The image is not here. Okay, um, uh, there is a priority shift also take place in both Japan and India. So what recently happened is uh, national security strategy and uh, national defense strategy and uh, new uh, defense build-up program. So there is an, okay, so, um, I don't know, I exhausted that first. <laughs> so this actually talks about the shift in the Japanese uh, uh, way of looking at uh, the challenges they are going to face in the region. And China, and uh, the Japan never hesitated to uh, call out China and Russia, and uh, they think the only way to um, uh, challenge those China and Russia is to, to through cooperation. And uh, that is the problem with uh, uh, Japan, uh, problem with India also. Japan always think why uh, India is very hesitant to call out names like China, which has been a major problem for India. And uh, national security strategy, everybody uh, talked about like uh, the Japan, which is trying to uh, attain like long range capabilities. But it actually, if you read that national security strategy clearly, actually Japan is looking at multi-domain operation capability where it tries to bring on uh, uh, cyberspace, electrospectrum, land space and cyberspace and maritime. So it includes everything. I think Japan is like moving in, in like uh, if you see the national security strategy, uh, it's amazing actually. They are they are going to be a major power in another, uh, uh, in another uh, 15 to 20 years. And there is again the, uh, the, the again that national security strategy also emphasizes on deepening the Japan-US alliance. So there is a shifting priority from Japan. So what's happening in India? So India, uh, recently uh, we saw this G20 where uh, India stationed itself as a kind of position itself as a uh, voice with the global south. There are two perspective emerges when the literature, like when we're looking at the newspaper. One is uh, some set of scholars talking about uh, India as a voice of the global south. And some people say that India can be the link with the global south. So these are the two important uh, uh, questions I think uh, we should explore, like probably the scholars can look at it. So how these things can be pan out and how it has been there. So India has been like a kind of always took a neutral stand. It has on the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. That has been a major kind of uh, uneasiness which created between uh, many Western countries, particularly with Quad countries. 
and um, and J india is very much uh, caution not to antagonize china so the problem here uh, when you are looking at india japan relationship so um, from india this is a, this is for uh, my japanese friends so these are the strength of india's foreign policy so it should not be perceived as a sign of weakness so uh, the major discussion uh, in the bilateral relationship largely uh, will be sorted out if there is an understanding on these lines and so what is the uh, way forward uh, the maritime governance uh, i think is a way forward it's not a new uh, uh, phenomenon it's there in unclos uh, preamble the unclos actually talks about the problem of ocean space or closely interrelated and need to consider as a whole so um, uh, unclos uh, given a kind of a set of rules like uh, how to deal and manage the critical situation in high seas so what are the two element of governance if you are looking at maritime governance is the establishment of common rules and effective enforcement of those rules so again there is a larger misconception when you talking about rule based order is not always necessary uh, that us military hegemony is needed uh, when you are talking about rule based order so this is a kind of general perception has been thought out saying that rule based order will work if us hegemony is in place but uh, india japan can really work out like i have steps which i will explain in the next step where how to really work out on rule based order Uh, so i think like india japan have uh, become a leaders of maritime governance in the indo pacific so why uh, india and japan on maritime governance uh, india and japan are the two largest asian economies immensely depend upon ocean for trade and energy uh, uh, like um, indian navy jms dev one of the finest navy i been i had an opportunity to visit most of the classes of uh, jms dev vessels so that they have a Uh, top notch uh, uh, naval force so i think we have all the reasons and we have also have a political inclination uh, with each other so that i think uh, maritime governance should be so what are the steps we should uh, really focus on so there should be a kind of maritime engagement with stakeholders not only with government to government discussions or like with military uh, talking with others uh, we should also involve uh, academia public policy shipping institute like like and uh, business groups which are like working on maritime domain not only uh, in india and japan but it also try to include uh, countries from asean and other countries who, which are very much interested in the uh, indo pacific so uh, discussion on building partnership in governance rather than discussing about it like i just want to like rather we are focusing on like india japan relationship as i mentioned before like it's rather than just pointing out the threat uh, we can have a kind of more partnership in terms of discussing how to mitigate those threat through uh, building uh, uh, public policy um, uh, th uh, through the interaction so uh, again uh, uh, my third point is to involve regional and other maritime powers to discuss the welfare of the ocean so uh, the discussion should not continue with india and japan but it should it should also include all the regional countries at the extra regional pass so i mentioned prevent militaries from overshooting it's to mean that not to bring a military discourse into discussing all those things rather than trying to be as a kind of public policy way to address the issue so that probably it can give a kind of new nuances to how to solve the problem so i'll stop here if there is any question i'll be to answer thank you thank you very much an excellent presentation again this is a cliched uh, uh, usage but uh, really it is very very useful um, i only don't agree one thing with you or any of those people that we should not annoy Ch Ch antagonize china china is already annoyed with us you are having uh, you know you don't have an alliance but you are doing exercise you have the quad you are you know doing all sorts of things together so maybe we don't name it as an alliance we don't have a treaty uh, in in that sense but uh, i think we should not be apologetic about our relation with uh, japan australia or usa so we need each other at this juncture it's not that india wanted to uh, you know contain china along with the uh, other no it is china that pushed india into the uh, the welcoming hands of the usa probably usa needed india at this juncture tomorrow things may change so india also need the presence of usa at this juncture if one has uh, followed uh, china's uh, actions in 
Southeast, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, a anywhere for that matter. So we should not be apologetic about this relationship, this friendship, which uh, we all are hesitant to call an alliance, okay, that our leaders know it better. So we have uh, around uh, uh, less than 15 minutes to conclude. They were very kind enough to allow 15 minutes to us. So I would be uh, requesting student community to ask questions. Professors all know all of these things. Uh, they are testing our uh, <laughs> knowledge, actually. So uh, if, uh, if I would request students to ask questions, please. Um, I would like please, to rec uh, recall an incident. In okay. 2021 April, a USS John Paul Jones has who, violated. Who are you addressing the question? Uh, anyone can, uh, okay. either Murali Dhanan sir or uh, from Niyaz. Okay. Yes, don't, okay. don't direct any questions at me. Okay, sir. <laughs> uh, in 2021, USS John Paul Jones violated India's ex exclusive economic zone under their freedom of navigational operations. So, this such sort of an event shows uh, how such kind of um, contradictions in the, uh, in the fundamentals of maritime perceptions uh, can create problems with uh, prospective partners in the Indo-Pacific. So, uh, do you have any um, opinion about how we can create uh, an, a rule-based order without creating common standards in the maritime delineations? I think we can. Uh, my name is Jishno. I am from uh, Kerala University. I am a researcher there. So, my question was about the, uh, there is much rhetoric about the strategic uh, technological alliance or collaboration between uh, India and uh, Japan, uh, including strategic sectors like uh, artificial intelligence, chip or uh, semiconductor technologies, uh, uh, cyber warfare, space technology, and defense, defense technologies. But uh, many of our speakers, even the uh, uh, previous sessions, have uh, pointed out that they, th these are lagging. So my question is, uh, is the US, uh, US foreign policy and uh, US's uh, um, uh, US companies uh, uh, market uh, uh, orientations are lagging it behind. If, uh, are they responsible for, uh, in any sense, to the uh, slowing down of the technological collaboration between India and Japan? MB Muralidharan sir has spoke about the 75,000 square kilometers are given for India for deep sea mining purpose. And he said happily that uh, message. And also same time he mentioned about the artificial island which is created by China. And its invasion in the sea within 200 nauticals of jurisdiction around the island which will be a endanger to the neighboring coastal states. He mentioned that one. My question is, Already we have ICJ, International Court of Justice, which doesn't have power to control any nation which is the signatory to it. I repeat, ICJ, the International Court of Justice, does not have any power to control any the signatory state if it does not cooperate with the ICJ. And the International Seabed Authority has the power to permit any coastal state or landlocked state to do any work in the ocean. But it does not have the full power to monitor it, to control it. If any misuses done by that permitted country, if it doesn't pay the compensation, the affected country cannot approach any board to claim its loss. If so, how we will able to justify using the Indo-Pacific Ocean for public use of any country? To specific to Muralidharan, if India is permitted to use 75,000 square feet of sea for mining, absolutely the government of India does not have any instrument facilities for that. It has to give it a private agency 
and private agency will not be able to be controlled by the government in the land because the sea is far away from the land. This two question and Thank that you. question Thank to Sir, others are waiting. So yeah, mm -hmm. to that question to Pragas Panishelvam, and you have spoke about the climate change and the sea level is rising, and whatever we do in the sea, it is going to affect in the shore. So what the uh, sea erosion is not discussed anywhere whenever we discuss about the using of the high sea. I think we can. Freedom of navigation issues like uh, the USS uh, uh, UNCLOS actually uh, says that um, any signatory, like it says that uh, uh, military activity is allowed, but uh, India actually maintains that uh, 48 hours uh, prior uh, information has to be provided about uh, any foreign vessels uh, entering the EZ. So th this is the problem in the, there is so many arguments in foreign against this. I think that's what when I mentioned, when we're talking about maritime security issues, uh, the EZ is becoming a highly contested topic. Uh, so, um, uh, um, Admiral Sir will have some point to say. Yeah, actually that's an issue because technically exclusive economic zone, you know, we have three zones, I mean, you're all familiar. You have the territorial waters, the contiguous zone, and then you go into your exclusive economic zone. In territorial waters, if any warship or anybody is entering, they're supposed to take your prior permission. They also have a right to innocent passage in your other thing, provided you're moving. That is there. But US has been doing it not only here, but uh, in the South China Sea, etc., called freedom of navigation operations they're doing. So in this, you can object, you can say what you're saying, but some countries will continue doing it just to prove a point. And uh, whether you want to pick up a fight with it is different. Uh, practically, we have had cases, it comes to that IUU part of it. There was, I won't take the names of countries, there were a couple of countries who were actually sent their ships to monitor and get seabed data from our exclusive economic zone. They were not moving. So we operated ships in that area. If that ship is steaming up and down at high speed, you can't gather any data. No sensitive data will come. See, it's how you do it. It's just because we have the ship's the capability and you have to monitor your exclusive economic zone, which is why you have uh, satellites, your maritime patrol aircraft, your ships deployed all over. So it's a cat and mouse game. You just have to bait it. But if he comes into your territorial waters, you can take action as required. The other one is still international laws are a little flexible in this. Then the question of... Uh, well, the International Seabed Authority has actually the areas which are outside the exclusive economic zones of countries. The International Seabed Authority has allocated it to various nations who take interest in mining or taking that action. Now, that area does not belong to any nation. It's an international thing. So, even a landlocked country like uh, Switzerland can actually bid for it and take it. So we were actually given an area in uh, southern Indian Ocean, about 1,50,000 square mil kilometers. After our scientists have done their survey, <coughs> we have kept 75,000 where we feel that there could be worthwhile exploitation possible. The other areas we have returned to them. Now, there are certain responsibilities of the countries when you do it. It's like our own homes. You are not supposed to dump waste into your neighbor's territory or neighbor's house. So countries try and do it, and we have been doing it responsibly. We have been doing some uh, thing in the Antarctic where we got area. So we and it is expected that other nations will do it. And how nobody else comes and exploit, you have to monitor the area. That is why the aspect that I tapped on briefly called maritime domain awareness is very, very important of the area. When a threat is developing, you can come to know about it if you're monitored, which is where all countries are joined together. Now, we get inputs from multiple sources for the information fusion center. 
Similarly, in the small limited case of piracy, we had a recap organization in Singapore where for a long time a Japanese officer was heading it, coordinating all inputs. Right now, there's an Indian officer, the previous uh, Director General of the Indian Coast Guard has gone to head it. Similarly, there was a London-based organizer operating. So all these you have to do, but if any country dumps waste or does not protect as he takes out the material, it's like this. Like you can just have a simple ship coming and saying we had a breakdown uh, of, I think, it, between the most recent incident just off Sri Lanka. One of the ships goes down to avoid fuel uh, leakage and uh, damaging of the thing. All the maritime forces of the area, the Indian Navy, Coast Guard, the Sri Lankan forces, all cooperated together to ensure that the effect is contained. So forget about deep sea mining. We have regular cases of, say, ships breaking down or leakage or deliberately dumping waste in the mid-ocean, which can come into your area. So this is something we have to take it as it comes. So, uh, on deep side mining, on one second, uh, see, uh, it's like uh, it's for humanity. So uh, we can't say that, okay, the state can't involve or invest in the high seas. Um, and second thing, deep side, mi uh, deep side mining, like uh, you said that the International Court of Justice is not uh, functioning or it doesn't have power. I, I think that's not very accurate, like actually. Because if you want to file a case in the International Court of Justice, the, both the party has to accept the mandate what ICG is going to deliver. Like for example, the Philippines between Chinese and Philippines uh, uh, arbitrary over that particular island, both Philippines filed the case and China also said, but whether uh, both the countries are going to implement it, whether agreeing to it, that is something different. But the International Court of Justice actually comes out with a kind of a plan or kind of uh, uh, suggestion how to resolve the issues. But calling them is completely, this is the way international system works, it takes a lot of time uh, to mature, like for example, like if you see about like 200 years ago, there is no, this kind of discussion happens, like anybody can go anywhere. So we have right now saying that territorial waters, like 12 nautical miles, like there is a very good book written by O.P. Sharma on UNCLOS on India. So if you read that how entire things come up, it doesn't come overnight, it takes centuries actually. Okay. So yes. I think, uh, um, Madam, uh, you want to add something? No, thank you. I think some people have to cash train. I'm sorry, we are having a lunch, so you can ask uh, them during the lunch time. So lunch would be more interesting at that time. So I'm forced to close the session here. Before that, um, I also wanted to share something about uh, my times in Arunachal going, how we reached Pumla in those days and all. It's all very interesting things, um, but we don't have the time for that. I'm so sorry. Uh, we thank uh, on behalf of my panelists for this wonderful session, in my opinion. Uh, we want to thank Miss Neelima. Where is Neelima? Uh, uh, thank you, Neelima, for uh, uh, organizing this session so well. She had to put in a lot of effort to bring in all these old people. And, uh, and, and we thank uh, CPPR and uh, the Japanese consulate in Chennai for the wonderful hospitality. We all enjoy, really. The food was good. So that sort of uh, things will come from the organizers. But on behalf of my panel, uh, I convey our thanks. Uh, even the PA system was wonderful. Uh, the guys who are doing it, thank you very much. Uh, God bless you all. Adrian, sir. We were able to view the prospects of Indo-Japan security and defense relations with newer perspectives. I would like to thank all the panelists for the excellent conversation. Now I invite Ms. Anu Anajo, Senior Associate Research of CPPR, to give a token of appreciation to the chair and the panelists. I request uh, Mr. Muralidharan Nair to come forward and receive the token of appreciation.
I would like to invite uh, Ms. Neelima A, Research Associate of CPPR, to give the key highlights of the event. Good afternoon to everyone present here. With immense gratitude to Team CPPR, we have come to the conclusion of this conference. And we are thankful to you for joining us from different parts of India and Japan. To our panel members, thank you for making the time and taking the effort of traveling long distances, changing multiple flights and joining us here in Kochi to make this two-day conference a success. We have spent over 12 hours discussing and deliberating on Indo-Pacific uh, Vistas for India-Japan relationship and cooperation organized by Center for Public Policy Research with a very kind support from Japanese Consulate General in Chennai. I stand before you now to attempt at summarizing the insights from this conference as concisely possible with the knowledge that the summary does not do justice to the multitudes of insights our speakers and moderators brought out in the past five sessions. Dr. D. Danuraj welcomed everyone at the conference and shared the long history of friendship and based on ties and spiritual affinity between India and Japan. And now the relationship has evolved to newer levels of political and economic importance. Respected Deputy Consul General Kenji Miyata-san talked about how India as the G20 chair and Japan as G7 chair is expected to play an essentially timely role for the further development of the bilateral relation as it is important to share knowledge and cooperation for international cooperation. Professor M.D. Nalapat, in his keynote speech, brought out the geopolitical imperatives of India and Japan working together. He highlighted the need for an Indo-Pacific Charter where PM Modi and PM Kishida San can look to light the universal important lamp of learning as this is the Indo-Pacific century. This could be an event that sends in line progress, partnerships and cooperation for both Indian and Japanese, Japanese people and also for the world at large. We also heard remarks by Mr. P. Hormis Taragan, who propounded the, on the need for cooperation with the two nations and how this conference can act as a way to bridge the current gaps and challenges that the region of the Indo-Pacific is facing. Dr. Anthony Dawson D. Silva, the trustee of CPPR, presented the vote of thanks. On the first day, we had three technical sessions. Technical session uh, one, synergies between IPOI, FOIP, and AOIP was chaired by Dr. W. Lawrence S. Prabhagar and had presentations from Dr. Kashitoshi Tamari Sa, Professor Geetanjali Sinha Roy, and Ms. Sanjana Joshi. The discussions revolved around key points that include the geopolitical, geostrategic, and economic significance of the Indo-Pacific construct, the synergies in the Indo-Pacific vision are being formed from the understanding of the economic opportunities of the region along with its strategic significance. The major discussion points were the epidemiology of the Indo-Pacific construct and Japanese and Indian visions of the Indo-Pacific. The China factor and how it activated the geostrategic significance of the region. The session went on to highlight the emergence of the military security and cooperation as one of the crucial areas of focus for the countries in the region and the conversations highlighted the need for institutional mechanisms for maritime security and cooperation. The speakers also spoke about the non-traditional aspects as well as the most identified area of synergy in India-Japan ASEAN nexus. Technical session two, cooperation in emerging technologies, shipping and seaports was shared by Dr. R.P. Pradhan and other panelists were Daisuki Kawaisan, Mr. Prasoon Ag Agrawal and Dr. A.D. Gnana Gurunadan. The session revolved around how more connectivity will provide more growth opportunities for the nation. For Japan, the island perspective is crucial in their strategy as the world discusses more and more about the Blue Dot Network and Malabar exercises and Blue Economy ideas by Gun Gundar Poli. India and Japan's maritime cooperation has placed significant import Im importance on maritime domain awareness to ensure maritime security and address the challenges in the Indo-Pacific and Indian Ocean region, where one can expect to see further efforts from both the countries in this regard. There were also discussions on the role of emerging technologies in socio-economic development of societies. It highlighted specifically the critical technology cooperation between two countries in the chip designing and manufacturing industries and space exploration. 
the day came to an end with the technical session 3 best practices in disaster risk management chaired by myself and the panelists of the sessions were mr rainy lokos dr hari kumar and noriko sakurai san the discussions revolved around how disaster management will be one of the crucial agendas of india and japan with both the countries presiding g20 and g7 in the year 2023 in order to set the tone for the session, the incredible work done by the Kerala Fire and Rescue Department for the biggest present day issue of Kochi, the Brahmapuram Fire, was elaborated upon by Mr. Lukos, along with the uh, learnings from the Kerala floods in 2018. There were also discussions on how India should focus more on the understanding of the disaster, reducing the vulnerability and increasing the capacity and learn from Japan on these terms. Noriko San deliberated on several projects undertaken by JICA with sustainability and inclusive rural growth at its core along with a focus on emerging technologies, public-private partnership and community involvement. She also brought to, our, brought to our focus the importance of recognizing flood characteristics and identifying flood management challenges which are being key to mitigate uh, disasters. Today on 17th March, the final day of the conference started with the technical session 4, Opportunities and Challenges in the India-Japan Relations, Special Strategic and Global Partnerships, chaired by uh, Dr. Vijay Sakucha. The other panelists of the session were Dr. Sato Takahai Rosan, Dr. Rupak Jodi Bora Namsai, and Dr. Anmol Mukia. The session highlighted how connectivity is the buzzword of the era, and is essential in advancing bilateral relationship and investment between India and Japan, and how cognitive connectivity ensures further development and investment to the region. There are further much more scope for cooperation as there is an increase in Japanese investment in India with a rise in GDP by 30 times from 1995 to 2017. Japanese MNCs have quantitative and qualitative contributions to India's make in India and self-reliant India. Also, there were discussions surrounding, surrounding the close ties of India-Japan, which seep into Northeast India just as much. Whether it's the cultural influence among the youth or the changing policy attention in the region through the relations shared between two countries. Japan is playing a crucial role in uh, infrastructural development of the Northeast Asian and this is developing in the tandem to India's evolved look east, policy, look east to act east policy. I would like to reiterate uh, the point made by Dr. Anmol on the cruciality of the integration and connectivity, not only of the physical nature, but also in terms of people-to-people -people and cultural connectivity for the growth of this relationship and of the Indo-Pacific and Asian region. Technical Session 5, Convergence and Challenges for India and Japan in Indo-Pacific, Security and Defense Cooperation was the final link to this very holistic conference. How could relationship between two nations be discussed in the contemporary landscape without deliberating on the conventional aspects of the security and defense? The session was shared by Mr. Murli Dharan Nair. The other panelists of the session were Vice Admiral MP Murli Dharan, Dr. Mari Izuyama San, Dr. Prakash Panir Selvam. Dr. Mari San uh, kicked off the session by highlighting the role of India, highlighting the role India could play in the in building a stronger alliance with Japan and establishing an order in the Indo-Pacific region. Keeping in view the growing Chinese threat, India's strategic economy and uh, transformation of Japanese security strategies, India is likely ally for Japan. Vice Admiral M. Murali then pointed out the significance of Indian Ocean, a key region for seven seas and propounded on the future role it holds. He brought Back to our attention, the role India sees Japan play in Indo-Pacific and Sagar. Our final speaker for the conference, Dr. Selvam, articulated on China's militia use in the Indian region, leveraging India and Japan's capabilities to tackle cyber security attacks in shipping industries globally, the swift growth of the relationship between the two nations over the last three decades, and the strategic shift in the defense strategies of both the nations. While one can go on to bring more insights from the conference, I will stop for now. The common thread which weaved the sessions and the discussion through the two days was a hope of cooperation among India and Japan for a strategically secure and economically more efficient and progressive relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Neelima, for rightly summarizing the event. Now I invite uh, Kenji Miyata-san, 
Deputy Consul General, Consul, uh, Consul General of Japan in Chennai for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Nirima-san, for uh, summarizing uh, today's uh, conference. Uh, as she said, uh, we had an uh, uh, active discussion on a lo lot of issues, and uh, there are many uh, good analysis, ideas, and suggestions. Also, we have uh, difficulty and challenge as well. But uh, I found, I realized uh, there are many potential and the possibility to uh, expand our cooperation. And in this sense, I thank all speakers, panelists for your contribution. We had uh, <coughs> discussed the connectivity in many fields. Uh, personally, I was connected all of you and uh, I believe, uh, uh, as Professor Nalpat said yesterday, uh, this, we can take this conference to use uh, for further our future cooperation. I believe uh, your personal connection will contribute to expand your friendship, uh, but also uh, expand uh, our relationship in the, and Japan. We, uh, Consul General of Japan at Chennai, will continue to work with you for uh, Japan, India relationship and cooperation. Uh, finally, I would like to express my sincere appreci appreciation to Dr. Danraj and his team for hard work to make, in, make this conference big success. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Kenji Miyata-san, for your words. Now I invite uh, Dr. Danuraj, Chairman of CPPR, for his concluding remarks. Good afternoon, and uh, I don't want to stand uh, between lunch and you uh, at this point of time, but uh, I think it's a very relevant uh, conference that uh, we are concluding now. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida-san is in New Delhi next week, and uh, when we were uh, planning to organize this event, I don't think we were having that idea that Prime Minister of Japan is visiting India. And I am told today by uh, some of my colleagues uh, from the fraternity that uh, he will be uh, uh, coming to India again uh, for G20 leadership meeting. And Prime Minister Modi is uh, visiting Japan in the month of May. And uh, in fact, uh, Prime Minister Kishida-san is here in this year for the second time. So that shows the growing uh, partnership and engagement between the two countries, and I'm sure this particular conference will also adding to the, the beautiful literature between India and Japan. Um, I'm so happy that uh, we had a very fruitful, engaging conversation on various topics uh, related to India and Japan relations. And uh, as many speakers uh, uh, mentioned here, we make friends. We meet friends, and uh, I think this friendship and fraternity will substantially contribute to the uh, Indo-Japan relations in the coming years. Um, we also, uh, I actually picked up many topics from the uh, speakers' presentations for the further future interactions and uh, developing some concept notes for the future seminars and conferences and academic literature. Uh, and uh, I, I think one aspect that we should look into is one is about uh, Bay of Bengal, ASEAN, um, and uh, ASEAN Highway, uh, Northeast connectivity, and uh, the linkages between uh, these two regions. Uh, I'm also um, uh, excited to see, uh, I mean, listen to the speakers mentioning non military infrastructure investments. Uh, in this part of the in this part of the world by Japanese uh, uh, aid agencies um, G7 leadership of Japan and G20 leadership of India um, at this very particular uh, time of uh, global uh, order so I I'm sure there could be many many topics uh, probably we should uh, look at uh, as we proceed with uh, Indo-Japan relations. So I thank all the speakers, participants uh, for their uh, 
uh, support, involvement, and presentations. And I, I find uh, most of our, uh, I mean, our Q&A &Q sessions were also very engaging. Many interesting questions were asked. And um, uh, um, I think more insights are there uh, at the end of this session, at the end of this conference, I see that a lot more literature is added to Indo-Japan relations. I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, the Consul General uh, Takazan. Uh, he, he could not make it because of Prime Minister uh, Kishida San's visit to New Delhi uh, next week. Uh, in his absence, uh, we have with us Vice Consul uh, Miyata San, and uh, I thank him for his uh, support and uh, guidance. Um, as a token of appreciation, uh, I request uh, my colleague uh, uh, Agangsha Gupta, Senior Research Associate in CPPR, to give the, the very Malayali Kerala uh, uh, token to <laughs> Vice Consul. I also take this opportunity to thank all the speakers uh, uh, who accept our invitation, uh, came all the way from Tokyo, from Delhi, uh, to other parts of the country, to Kochi. Uh, and I know this is the end of the financial year and also the end of the academic year for many universities and colleges. Still then they found some time to come and participate in this conference. Thank you so much and I wish, um, uh, uh, I reiterate my uh, point uh, on fishermen issues. Uh, you know, this was one of the point of uh, discussion last three, four sessions. Uh, I'm sure CPPR will be hosting an international conference on fishermen issues, especially in this region, because I started my career in fishery sector 15 years, 16 years back, and I travel across uh, east and west coast of India. I understand and acknowledge the issues uh, faced by fishermen. Not only in India, I think across the region, whether it's in Sri Lanka, Maldives, ASEAN countries, or in Gulf, uh, Oman, and other countries. So we are pushing this agenda for some time to have a regional framework, a charter if possible, about uh, the issues related to uh, fishermen uh, and, well, the sail and cross the international borders. So I look forward to, I'm sure uh, we will invite you all for that conference in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Danuraj. Now I request Anu Maria Francis, Research Associate at CPPR, for delivering the vote of thanks. Uh, distinguished guest on and off the dais, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. I won't take much, much of your time. <laughs> so it's my honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on the special occasion of the Second International Conference on India-Japan Relations, titled Indo-Pacific Vistas for India-Japan India Relationship and Cooperation, organized by Center for Public Policy Research with the support of Consulate General of Japan in Chennai. It's officially the time of the conference when we wrap up all the discussions and deliberations. The conference aimed to bring out the potential goals, uh, challenges and vision that encompass India-Japan relationship and cooperation, keeping Indo-Pacific vistas at its core. We hope the conference has brought out insights for all, you, all of you and presented a clearer path forward for the two nations to grow together while helping the growth of Indo-Pacific region. So for me personally, there were a few points that stood out, uh, stood out the most. We need a Japanese and Asian perspective in the context of Indo-Pacific in order for a holistic growth of the region. And all the nations in the region are even affected by it, uh, affected by the region. A thought of like the Indo-Pacific Charter, which was discussed by Professor Nalapat. So without much uh, further ado, I, let me continue to my duty. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Consulate General of Japan in Chennai under Takamaya Sukisa, uh, the Consul General who make the way for organizing the conference on Indo-Pacific Vistas for India-Japan relationship. Thank you, sir, uh, for the constant support, uh, guidance, and encouragement in his absence. Uh, we have with us uh, Kenji Miyatasa, the Deputy Consul General of Japan, representing the Consulate General of Japan in Chennai. I'm thankful for his uh, esteemed presence throughout the conference and for the insightful comments in, an, in the inaugural and valedictory. Uh, on behalf of CPPR, we extend our sincere thanks to Kenji Miyadasa. 
Next, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our esteemed guest, Professor M.D. Nalapat, in his absence for inaugurating the conference and delivering an enlightening keynote address and for the invigorating discussion with Ms. Anishri that shed light to the Indo-Japan relations in a holistic way, giving us a very comprehensive outlook. Your words have left an indelible mark in our minds and inspired us to look at things from a global peace perspective. We would like to extend our sincere thanks to all the experts and delegates who have joined us from Japan and India. We extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Kasuto Shitamari, Ms. Mr. Dasuki Kawaisa, Ms. Noriko Sakuraisa, Dr. Sato Sa, Dr. Dubak Jodi Bora, Dr. Yoshiko Mari, Doc, uh, Dr. Prakash Panishalva, Dr. Anmol Mukhia, Dr. Hari Kumar, Mr. Prasun Agrawal, Dr. Jnana Gurunathan, Ms. Sanchana Joshi, Ms. Gidantali Sinha, and Mr. Reni Lokos. Uh, we hope to continue our engagement further to continue the conversations and to bring out recommendations and suggestions for the strengthening of Indo-Japan relationship. I also express my sincere thanks to the participants from different institutions and organizations, including Indo-Japan Chamber of Commerce in Kerala, the Central University of Kerala, MG University, University Manipal, Academy of Higher Education, KUSAT, College of Ship Technology, and others. CPPR is also thankful to us, advisors and distinguished fellows who have joined us to today. We extend our sincere gratitude to Professor W. Lawrence S. Prabhagar, Dr. R.P. Pradhan, Dr. Vijay Sakuja, uh, Mr. P.K. Hormis Taragan, Vice Admiral M.P. Murali Dharan, Mr. Gobinath Panangad for their endless support. Our advisors have been always a pillar of strength throughout the journey of CPPR. Your expertise and commitment have been invaluable in helping us achieving our goals. Once again, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all the advisors and fellows who are with us today. We would also like to express our gratitude to all the media friends who have attended the conference at our invitation. We thank you for all your efforts and are keen on continuing working together in the future. Without the diligent efforts of my dear senior colleagues, this conference would not have been possible. I extend my sincere gratitude to our chairman, Dr. Danuraj, Mr. Prashant Jena, Mr. Raju T. Matthews, Mr. Jo Paul J. Sakaria, and Dr. Anthony Rosen for their constant support, guidance, and encouragement throughout. <laughs> Special mention to Ms. Neelima, who led the main role in con organizing the conference. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to all the team members of CPPR, Ms. Anisri Suresh, Ms. Anuana Jo, Ms. Lisbeth Jivi, Ms. Aishwarya, Jishnu, Ms. Ju Ms. Juhi, Ms. Akansha, Mr. Kannan, Ms. Vidumol, Ms. Diana, Alan, Ms. Alan, Mr. Allen, Ms. Shruti, Ms. Trisha, Ms. Mr. Tom, Ms. Ashna, Mr. Nikhil, Mr. Atul, and my co-host, Ms. Sh Shilpa, and the communication team of CPPR, Mr. Wilfred, Asif Mohammed. Mr. Rajesh and Ms. April, who worked behind the scenes. Thank you to the photography and videography team for covering the event seamlessly. CPPR would also like to appreciate the immense support that we have received from the team at Hotel Avenue Regent. We have had a very pleasant experience organizing our events here. Thank you for the coordination. Once more, I would like to express my gratitude to all who have joined us today for the two-day conference. We hope all of you have a fabulous time, had a happiest time attending the conference. And we look forward to continuing the discussions later on. Thank you. <laughs>